Welcome to Future Work, the podcast where we bring you practical tips and insights on the ever-evolving landscape of work. Join us as we explore the trends, innovations, and challenges shaping the way we work today and tomorrow. Okay, so we're here for a new episode of Future Work with Stephanie Lee. Stephanie is the head of people experience at Nansen, which I'm sure we'll hear about more soon. Before that, she was at Buffer and at Cargo One, and she is one of the leading experts on remote work in Asia. Welcome, Stephanie. Thanks for having me here, Dan. I'm really excited. <laughs> I'm also super excited. So maybe to start, could you share a little bit about your, your background and your experience in the field of employee experience? Yeah, so I started my career in tech, the whole like employee experience piece. Actually, I want to say that my career in tech preceded the employee experience piece because when I first joined tech, from teaching, I was given a really cool title, you know, back when we had really cool titles in tech. I was called the lifesaver at Buffer and, and my task, my mandate was just, you know, see what's broken and fix save it. Save lives? Yeah, save lives basically. <laughs> <laughs> and in the course of that, mm. you know, operations became really clear that it was a pain point at Buffer because mm. we were fully remote, coming out of the teal organization flat mm. structure. So they needed to build processes and stuff. So I started there and then I did finance for two years and then kind of joined the people team and figured out like what I wanted to do in the people team. But in the course of that, I was also doing a bunch of the company retreats and it became clear that what I really enjoyed was kind of building the infrastructure around cool experiences for our remote team. And that's kind of how I became the team experience manager at Buffer. Yeah, you just, just floated along. I just floated along <laughs> and did what was interesting. <laughs> it just happened. You just ended up here. Hey, and maybe just to take one step back. So you said that they were in a teal organization. That sounds interesting. Yeah. So uh, if you've read the book, Reinventing Organizations, it's really this idea of like not having hierarchy. It was really flat. And this was before I joined Buffer. So it was like pre-2016. Um, and the idea was that we would move fast by having little like task forces kind of do what they do best. You know, Buffer as a pioneer in remote work was also really big on work experiments. And that was one of the experiments. And when I joined, they were coming out of that experiment, kind of really growing the team at the time. Interesting. And then you moved from Buffer to Cargo One. Yeah. So from social media management to air cargo, <laughs> digitalizing air cargo, still remote teams. That's kind of like the red thread. I really like that. And it was a different kind of employee experience design because I was remote lead there. And it was really about how do we come up with a company operating system that works for our remote team across the world. And then when I was at Cargo One, interestingly, I was on a head of remote panel at a conference and they were taught one of the topics was what is the future of the head of remote and I was like I think it's gonna kind of branch out into head of workplace design and head of people experience kind of portfolios and shortly after that conference I got a an opportunity with Nansen and it was around people experience and I was like I called it <laughs> so that's that's how I landed where I am today. Makes sense. Yeah, I remember the uh, chief remote officer at GitLab said the same thing. Eventually, this role will disappear. But for now, we still have to say remote because it's not the usual way. Um, and so now you're at Nansen. So tell us a bit more about the company and then your role within that. So Nansen is a blockchain analytics company. We surface the signal in the blockchain world to help people make more informed decisions when they make investments, when they make any kind of decision um, to do with their crypto or if they want to ape into what other people are doing uh, with their transactions, they can just look at whatever dashboard gives them that information. I mean, as you know, the whole crypto industry has been going through a bit of a winter lately and we had quite a dramatic end of year last year. And the, the team's been amazing at shipping really cool features and products that help people, you know, live to this mission. So one of the cool things that they shipped was like proof of reserves for the exchanges. 
So it's really been really fun to work with this team. They're so smart. They're at the forefront of technology. They're all across the world. We're 150 people now in 39 countries, last I checked. All kinds of cultures, all kinds of backgrounds, and all really excited to be building cool stuff. So before you share a bit more about your role, so 150 people across so many countries. So what, what does the working model look like? How is that being managed? So we're remote first. One of the reasons why I'm really excited about Nansen is that it's probably the first remote first company that's trying to build at the scale that we build from Singapore. And that's where I'm from. That was always my dream when I was building European and US remote companies. I always wanted to do it in Singapore. So Nansen's makeup is really cool. Most of us are in Europe and APAC. And we are remote first, but we're also very sensitive to how fast we can go when we're all synchronous. So we don't shy away from synchronous work. What we do is we try to optimize team makeup so there's as much overlap as possible so people can move as fast as they want to move through meetings and stuff. But of course, we still endeavor to train them to do more async work. So it's not a hurdle. We currently have four hubs where we cover people's one month travel to each of these hubs in a year so they can meet their team, they can meet other people in the company and get that face time in because that's really important. So I think we're remote first and hybrid, hybrid friendly. <laughs> Remote first, hybrid friendly. And what does the head of people experience do at a company that has that kind of working model? What, what does your day-to-day -day look like? People experience has a few sub-functions within it or a few streams. Uh, a big one is learning and development because we're big on that. So we focus a lot on individual development and manager development. Another part of it is being like a culture champion. So last year, I shipped the culture playbook, which kind of articulates what we stand for and our operating principles and kind of how to use it in our day-to-day -day lives. We also do engagement and events like the company retreat. We took 120 people to Bali in January from across the world. It was an adventure <laughs> for all of us. <laughs> and we also, part of the engagement and events piece is measuring the results of that. So uh, we have regular engagement surveys, stuff like that. And then I also partner with our operations team very extensively to build our people ops and experience infrastructure. So how do we support people with our hubs program? How do we set people up for a seamless experience regardless of where they are in the world? So that's kind of people experience in a nutshell. Yeah, super impressive. And, you know, as the first real remote first company born out of Singapore, <laughs> Um, and I don't dare to say real, but did I say real? <laughs> hey, we, we, we can claim that right now. <laughs> As this remote first company born out of Singapore, what do you see and what have you learned along the way that you think most companies are getting wrong when it comes to remote work, hybrid work, the way they deploy employee experience? What are some lessons that you can share to the audience? I mean, this is happening across the world. We tend to see them as binary, right? Either remote first or hybrid first. I've always said, even when I was at Buffer, I think the way to go for hybrid to succeed is to design your operating system to be remote first. There's no real reason why we should be afraid of in-person meetings. Besides, like the big caveat is equity and employee experience. But there is so much power when you get people in the same room and the energy is just unbeatable. Mm. Right. But what a lot of people have kind of gone into from what I've seen in like post COVID is they've kind of, especially the big companies, they've kind of gone allergic to remote first and they're like, oh, it's not productive. So we'll do hybrid where you can work in the office sometimes mandatory days and then you work remotely other times but then when I go to the office I'm sitting on my Zoom call and when I'm at home the only time I get to do work which is ironic because showing that working from anywhere actually works the office is not essential right that's because they haven't optimized for more async work more cloud-based collaboration I think that's what we've 
gotten wrong a lot of the time. I don't know if many companies are being thoughtful about how to assemble teams with the understanding that time zones are a limiting factor. Um, we do quarterly time zone audits at Nansen, and that's a very important thing for us to do because, you know, if someone is managing his whole team from, like, the opposite side of the world, it makes everything exponentially harder. So that's one thing. And then I think a lot of the struggle has also been how to have authentic virtual connection, I think, move past the idea of happy hour. <laughs> Nobody really wants to stay an additional hour after work to see their colleagues when they could be spending time with, you know, their family. How can we get people to engage like human beings mm. without feeling like it's additional work, without feeling like it's contrived, but still tied them through the in-person meetings? I don't know that a lot of companies have nailed that. A lot of the big companies just kind of default to, oh, we'll just gather in the office. But I'm sure we'll find a, a solution down the line. Totally, totally. Especially with people like you in the world, I'm sure we'll get to a much better place. Hey, you were talking about sometimes not being afraid of still meeting in person, not holding on too dearly to the idea of remote. Uh, you said the energy of having people in a room can be really important. How do you balance that with, you know, like you said, you have a big global team, you're sitting in different time zones. Does everyone have to organize retreats in Bali to make it work? <laughs> I would say if you can really set aside a big part of your employee experience budget to run a company retreat, the payoff is incredible. You won't believe the number of conversations I've had post a retreat where they were like, oh, now I know this person. Like, I've hung out with them. I've had a beer with them. You know, we've gone hiking together. I can just tap on their shoulder and Slack and be like, do you want to help with this community activity? Or I have this project in mind, like, you know, would you be keen on giving feedback or helping me run it or collaborating on it? These are things that are much harder if you've never seen someone in person. And the payoff of a company retreat is just amazing because there's also something to be said about shared experiences that build a sense of identity and belonging. And retreats are really good for that. Some companies do it twice a year. I feel like if you don't have a dedicated <laughs> retreat person, it's a lot of work. It's a huge amount of work. So once a year is great. We've recently launched our hubs program 2.0, which is folding team offsites with our hubs program. So we cover a month for people in any of the hubs, but we ask that they meet with their team part of that time. And this is really to try and find that happy medium where people have flexibility but they still sit down together, you know, go for paella somewhere or, I don't know, fish and chips in London. I don't know what the, the London team's going to hear this and be like, Steph does not know what's going on here. <laughs> you know, there's just something that's special when people are in the same room together. Yeah, I love that idea that suddenly after meeting people in person, it's then a little bit easier to tap them on the shoulder virtually and say, hey, can we collaborate on this? Because maybe you wouldn't feel comfortable or not safe enough to reach out to that person. You don't feel I know them personally. So there still is something about this whole in-person thing. Uh, you mentioned a few times the retreats. So that's something that you've done now across multiple companies. Um, it's something that costs a lot of money. But as you said, if you just bundle all the money that goes into otherwise things that may be a bit more forgettable for people and maybe not as meaningful, um, you can organize them. What goes into a good retreat? I think what goes into a good retreat is thinking about what your company needs at that point in time. So what the, ex the demands of the experience differs depending on what your company's made up of. Like, is it a bunch of tenured people that have worked together for a long time? Or have you had a hiring surge and you kind of need to build connection? Or have you just gone through a really tough market and you need to reward people and help people feel more rested and you know recharged right building in time to meet those needs like structuring your company and your team sessions around those needs is very important and also building in time for people to where you're not planning anything so being intentional about protecting decompression time yeah. time for organic connections that's really important when you've brought everyone across the world to meet. Otherwise, you're just kind of like forcing people, shuffling people from room to room, and then 
they'll be like, what just happened this week? I wanted to talk to that person, but I didn't get a chance to. So that's really important. And then kudos to my operational start in tech. I'm always a big fan of making everything so seamless that nobody has to worry about you know, how stressful international travel can be so that when they land there, all they need to focus on is showing up for the sessions. They know exactly where they need to be and who they're connecting with and they can fully show up. And then another thing I've learned over the years that's really important is setting the expectations and the tone at the start. So saying, this is a work event, be fully present. This means you don't have to be in the customer support inbox 24 seven, for instance. You know, if you need to go take a nap, go take a nap, but come back and be here with us, right? Expectations like that need to be communicated. Or I can guarantee you, your introverts are going to be burned out. And they're going to be like, Mm. this was the worst week of my life. (laughs) It was the best and the worst. (laughs) As an introvert, I can only agree. 100%. Hey, this sounds really interesting. So you do a retreat, not just to get people together, not just to have fun. You really focus on a strategic priority for the company and then build the program around it. I also like this idea of building in space for organic connections, right? I think something that we do very organically in the office is run into people, have small chats. If you program the day from 8 a.m. until late at night, then obviously there's no opportunity for that. So building in that space is really great as well. And then that idea of setting expectations at the start. So basically, yes, you're here. For some people, it was a short trip. For some people, it was a long trip. But here's what you can expect from us and here's what we, we can expect from you. Is there something in all of that that we can learn for more frequent meetings, even if they don't happen in person? Is there a mini retreat that we can do multiple times a year, even if that doesn't happen uh, again in person in Bali? Oh, yeah. I think it's always helpful for teams to kind of block off time part of the year. It could be at the start of your planning cycle, at the end, to wrap up, Mm. really depending on what you need, to take yourself out of doing your day-to-day business as usual to work on the business. So, for instance, our senior leadership has their summits where they sit down and they plan and review how things are going, right? The people team in Nansen is meeting in the middle of the year to do just that. I think that the value of that on the work and collaboration side is, you know, you get things done when you're in the same time zone when you've mentally blocked off time to be like, this is what we're focusing on. We don't have to worry about requests so much this week. Because you're in person or you've blocked off that, you bracketed that spot in your calendars, you can also spend more time to do fun things together and not be like jumping in a 30-minute call and trying to be like, how's your dog and how's everything? But also we have this work that needs to be done. You know, you can go to an escape room together. You can... Go for a picnic or the museum, depending on what your team likes, right? Or go to the spa. (laughs) I don't know if the spa is a very unifying experience, but, you know, it's like signaling that you're unwinding together, right? It's so valuable to protect some bits of time to do that. It also throws off the monotony of the year, which a lot of us, especially remote, can sink into, right? When you're like, oh, it's another cycle it's the same thing the same slack (laughs) it's the same inbox like uh just throwing things off and making it interesting interesting yeah that idea that every day starts to feel the same a little bit kind of going through through the motions really really fascinating i think a lot of good lessons here for everyone who wants to be more uh, remote friendly or who is thinking about like a different kind of working model to just to wrap it up what kind of advice would you give to hr leaders who are just starting to think about enhancing the employee experience in a remote or hybrid environment i think they can start by doing a gap analysis like a really honest review of where they're at I hesitate to say, do this one thing and it's going to improve because I'm 100% a fan of, you know, measuring what matters and coming up with solutions for your company at whatever point in time you are. So if it's a matter for company A, if it's they find that 
maybe the employees in certain parts of the world are not as engaged as others, then they can think about what they can do to engage those employees or figure out the reasons why. If it's about people feeling burned out, then your strategies and your approach would be quite different. Or if it's about people just getting super bogged down with busy work, then maybe what you can do for employee experience, even though it's not business operations, is to partner with business operations to be like, hey, how can we make things smoother for our folks so they feel like they can bring their best performance self to work, right? I think a key thing I've learned for employee experience, especially at Nansen, is you deliver your best work when you reach out cross-functionally and partner with other parts of the business. Because otherwise, we're just doing what some work for some other company. And we may not actually ship important impact. Beautiful. Okay. So it's not just one thing to do and then everything will be perfect. It's three things to do. One, you do your gap analysis. No. <laughs> you identify the main issues or the main opportunities are within your specific company. <laughs> You then create a strategy and an approach to try and solve those issues. And you have to work cross-functionally and make sure that it tailors to what the company needs. So I think those are very helpful and applicable uh, points for anyone to build a better employee experience for a remote company, for a hybrid company. Yeah. How do you then measure it, right? Because you're in a very data-driven company. Of course, the question is going to come up this all worth it? Is it working? How do you measure it? So we introduced engagement surveys two quarters ago, wait, three quarters ago now. And we either run a full engagement survey, like that happens once a year, and then we do pulse surveys throughout the year. Um, I think a good metric that a lot of companies already use is the ENPS. But it's also helpful to measure other kinds of engagement indicators. So do people feel excited to turn up to work? And do they feel heard and stuff like that? One thing that we're looking at as well for the next quarter is figuring out how to measure psychological safety in the company. Not to dox anyone, not to say like, oh, this team is not doing well, but to give us a very clear snapshot of how the teams are doing, honestly, and whether we can zoom in to support some particular teams. I think that's a good way to track it. You can also track, you know, if people are taking sick days and they're burning out, that's a good metric that a lot of people don't look at because a particular team is taking a lot of sick days. I think that's a good indication that something's happening, especially if it's remote and it's not a bug in the office. <laughs> yeah, we cannot blame the colleagues in the office that something is going around. It definitely came from your own environment. <laughs> okay. Amazing. This is really, really helpful. Yeah. Um, I think it's a great conversation about your experience, how your running things at uh, Nansen and also what other people can do. Um, I'm sure people are now super excited to plan the next retreat as long as they have good operational people to help pull it off. Um, but at <laughs> least start to do surveys, create that gap analysis and form a better employee experience strategy. So Steph, thanks so much for being on the program today. And where can people find you if they want to follow more of your uh, thinking and doing? I am at Steph underscore Lee pretty much everywhere. So that's Twitter, that's LinkedIn, that's, I think LinkedIn is Steph dash Lee. Uh, but if you look for Nansen, you'll find me. Um, I've been meaning to speak a bit more about all this stuff on social media. So I feel like this is the, this is the nudge <laughs> to do that. Commit. We're going to hold you accountable. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> yes. All right. So thanks so much for being on. Thanks for having me. All right. My pleasure. Bye-bye.